Hey guys, uh, and welcome to the uh, first part of the single board Z80 computer. Um, I'm learning as much as you guys are as we go here, uh, so if there are any uh, aficionados uh, out there and you spot a mistake, please tell me because um, I'd love to know rather than uh, slaving forever over a part that I'd, uh, that's wrong that I can't find. Um, so without further ado, let's get into it. Uh, if you want more information, uh, please drop a comment on my blog or something like that. I'll be happy to help out, although, uh, again, uh, I may not know as much as you. Uh, anyway, let's go. So here we can see the clock generation part of the circuit. Uh, this is the uh, crystal that will be generating the 4, four megahertz uh, frequency clock. And then uh, this is the logic that actually just kind of smooths out the signal of that clock. Uh, the CPU needs actually quite a uh, solid square wave. It can't be uh, jagged or anything like that. It has to be uh, a very square wave. Uh, otherwise, you start getting uh, problems. So, uh, a quick run through on this then. This is the crystal, as I said before here. Um, and then you have uh, this logic uh, surrounding the crystal just to generate a much smoother clock. These are in uh, inverters uh, so uh, if you have high on this side for example then you get low on this side uh, and if you have low on this side then you get high on this side uh, and essentially uh, this helps to smooth out the signal so uh, if uh, this side of the crystal is high uh, then obviously here will be low but there's also an element of negative feedback around here so uh, if this is low uh, a small portion of that will feed back into this part here and help it to go help it to switch uh, more easily uh, when the crystal switches to high Uh, then we have a capacitor in here and uh, finally uh, another same setup uh, but obviously just to do the inverse of what this one is doing so that one side uh, is high and one side is low and that will just generate a much smoother clock okay so moving on so next we're going to look at the actual processor itself uh, and its ROM uh, so this is the uh, Z80 processor, uh, it has 16 address lines and uh, 8 uh, data lines here and here. Um, and these are essentially the lines that are used to interface with uh, other parts of the system, whether that be the ROM, the RAM or even uh, I.O. like a keyboard or LCD display. Uh, these blue lines here are the buses for each of these uh, for the data this is the data bus and this is the address bus now this is the slightly complicated part of the system so a bus works by um, essentially a bus is a connection between all these different parts of the circuit and uh, everything that needs to access the data lines for example is connected up to this bus and that raises the question if it's all connected up connected up won't all the signals interfere with each other and uh, for example the RAM uh, store something that was meant to be stored in the ROM or something like that well uh, this would be the case if we didn't have con uh, separate control over each of the chips so each chip has an enable pin which essentially tells it whether or not to read in or write, read from the bus or write to the bus uh, and if that's not in the correct setting whether that be high or low uh, then uh, it will just uh, essentially be in a high impedance state and just ignore whatever's going on out here so that's why we can have everything connected up to each other uh, and still uh, have the system function correctly and this reduces the amount of wiring required uh, and essentially the CPU controls all of this using some uh, logic which is down here called glue logic uh, 
uh, that's the general term for it and essentially what it'll do is depending on what the CPU does on each of its pins whether it makes a memory request or an IO request uh, and a read or write request uh, this logic here will then interpret that and tell which one of these chips to read or write to the bus so what are the data and the address bus well the address bus um, is essentially what it says on the tin as is the data bus the address bus tells uh, whatever's on uh, the uh, which whichever bit of memory uh, what address in the memory uh, the CPU wants to read from uh, think of it like uh, a huge cabinet that where all the drawers are labeled as like uh, draw 0, draw 1, draw 2, draw 3 um, and each uh, one of these drawers obviously because as it's label uh, you can use a system where you want to say oh, okay I need to go to draw 3 well that's what the CPU does it tells the ROM or the RAM uh, which is up here uh, which draw it wants to access and then the ROM or the RAM will uh, either give out the data that's already in that uh, address over the data bus, data bus or uh, it will uh, read in the case of the RAM it will read from the data bus and store that 8-bit uh, uh, word in that address point now I just said 8-bit word there well essentially a word is kind of like uh, a chunk of data for example and in this case this is an 8-bit system so uh, we call it an 8-bit word so an 8-bit chunk of data each one of these lines will be one bit so that is the function of the address bus and the data bus uh, as just explained really just sends each uh, sends the data now uh, this is called an 8-bit CPU even though it's got 16 bits of addressing because it can only deal with 8 bits of data at a time even though it can address uh, 16 bits worth of uh, uh, different addresses so moving swiftly on we're just going to have a quick look at the different pins on the CPU so as you can see uh, these four pins here are all used uh, this is the memory request pin so whenever um, the CPU wants to access memory this will go low uh, and it tells uh, the glue logic down over here uh, that uh, it wants to access memory and uh, do something with it whether that be read or write the IO request thing is pretty much the same thing except it's whenever it wants to interface with the outside world whether that be reading from IO or writing to it in this case uh, obviously IO means input output and so if it wants to write then it's going to be using output and if it wants to read then it's going to be using input but this uh, pin can tell the glue logic that it uh, wants to do that and then the read and the write pins uh, are used with the uh, RAM uh, and ROM to tell it whether or not uh, it wants to um, read or write uh, to either of those chips and then uh, they're also used with uh, the IO to tell uh, the IO glue logic uh, whether it wants to uh, input or output data if we move down a bit we can see that several of these pins are actually connected to 5 volts which is just up here uh, and these pins uh, are essentially uh, these two pins here uh, int and NMI are uh, essentially interrupts so they uh, stop the processor from doing what it's currently doing and uh, tell it to uh, reset to a given point uh, depending on which one you use uh, then there's also a wait command which essentially delays the processor for a, uh, for a period of time to um, stop it uh, from completing the task until you need it to. Uh, this can be used if, for example, you have something else that's accessing the same memory uh, and you want the uh, and that takes precedence over the processor, then uh, you can use this pin to stop it from doing what it's doing.
and then there's a reset pin here which is just connected up to uh, a switch further up uh, so that this can be manually reset uh, if something goes wrong for example uh, all of these pins are active low that's what these uh, little dots mean uh, and so they're pulled high by being connected to 5 volts to uh, stop them from doing anything because we don't want to use them in this particular project then finally we have ground VCC and the clock pin uh, and also the bus request pin uh, now 5 volts uh, is obviously just a connection to f uh, VCC is a connection to the high voltage in this case 5 volts ground is just a connection to 0 volts or ground uh, and then clock is a connection to the oscillator part of the circuit that was explained earlier now bus request uh, is just uh, connected to uh, 5 volts this time again because we don't need it and uh, here is just a close up of the uh, data lines and then the address lines across here so uh, let's move on to the RAM the ROM so this is the ROM uh, in this case uh, this is an EEPROM uh, erasable programmable read only memory uh, it has 15 address lines and 8 data lines the 8 data lines are obviously just connected to the data bus and the uh, 15 address lines are just connected to the address bus uh, or in this case straight across to the processor and so um, this is essentially uh, the chip that stores uh, anything that's constant regardless of uh, what program the chip, uh, the CPU is running uh, I'm going to discuss this more in a later part so uh, we'll uh, move on from that from now its basic operation uh, is just uh, these two pins here now uh, there's an output enable pin this one here and a uh, chip enable pin and essentially these pins tell uh, the chip whether or not uh, it should uh, for the output enable pin whether or not it should output uh, what's in the uh, address here uh, on this onto the data bus and um, what's in the address that's uh, on the address uh, lines here uh, what what data stored in there whether it should output that uh, onto the data bus or uh, whether or not the chip itself is actually enabled at all uh, and then we just have a connection to 5 volts again okay so moving on to the RAM here we can see the RAM chip again this has 15 address lines uh, and uh, 8 uh, data lines and they're each connect connected to their uh, buses this chip has uh, a few more interfacing pins uh, with the chip select pin, the output enable pin uh, and also the um, uh, write enable pin uh, and so uh, they again essentially do what they say on the tin the uh, chip select pin just tells the chip that it needs to be uh, on at this time or needs to uh, do something with the data bus the output enable pin tells it that it needs to output whatever was at that uh, the address that's on the address bus and needs to output the data that's stored in there and the uh, write uh, enable pin uh, tells it that um, whatever is on the data bus at this time needs to be uh, stored in the address that's on the address bus here we can see our uh, memory decoder and our IO decoder uh, so what these do is they're essentially uh, what I was talking about earlier they're the glue logic for the uh, circuit so the memory decoder takes uh, inputs from the CPU uh, the Z80 processor and uh, essentially decodes that uh, and tells which chip, whether it be the RAM or the ROM, uh, which chip should be receiving that data. 
so it controls the chip select pins or the chip enable pins for uh, each uh, for each chip so uh, uh, this essentially this chip is dependent on mem request being low uh, so this will do nothing uh, if mem request is high uh, mem request only goes low when the uh, C CPU actually makes a request for memory because again uh, mem request is an active low pin as well on the actual CPU uh, we have one connection to ground because of the way the internal logic works here we only need to actually control one of these pins the other one can be connected to ground and it'll flick between these two uh, lines uh, these are default high and uh, depending on which one is selected that one will be pulled low and then we have control over A15 now uh, this is where it gets slightly complicated the CPU has uh, 15 uh, address lines and so that allows it to access 64k of memory however we don't want all 64k of our memory to be in one of the chips we want 32k of ROM and 32k of RAM so how do we work around this well essentially uh, we can use a15 which you can see is not on connected to the address bus uh, we can use that to tell uh, the glue logic which side we want you only need uh, 15 address lines a0 to a14 to access 32k of memory so our first 32k of memory is actually the ROM as you can see here so if we're on if uh, a15 is low then we're only trying to access the first 32k of memory uh, bear in mind this is actually a binary number uh, so for example if only a0 is high then it's a accessing address uh, 1 uh, and so on uh, so if we're only using uh, A14 through A0 then we're only trying to access the first 32k of memory and so uh, the glue logic knows that uh, that must be the ROM if A15 goes high we're trying to access the uh, second bank the second 32k bank of memory which is defined as the RAM and so uh, when A15 is high uh, instead of this pin being low this pin goes low uh, and then that enables the RAM and disables the ROM uh, and then whatever's on the uh, address bus will actually be interpreted by the ROM uh, not by interpreted by the RAM not by the ROM uh, so that's how uh, that bit of glue logic works the IO request uh, the IO decoder uh, glue logic actually works in much the same way uh, except uh, it's just doing it for uh, IO rather than uh, memory uh, and actually uh, we're actually controlling two of the pins so we can use these uh, outputs here because the operation of the IO is uh, slightly different from the memory these uh, these look like two separate chips but uh, they're actually this will actually be one chip uh, with two uh, two of these mem uh, decoders kind of uh, in one package and that just saves us space so let's go and look at the IO and then we'll uh, come back here and uh, quickly look at uh, how this decoder works So, this is the output register. It has connections to all of our data lines. I actually need to put in a uh, the uh, label for the line there. I'll make sure I do that. Um, and then uh, so it has access to the data bus, and then access, and then uh, essentially access to the uh, data lines for uh, whatever uh, it's outputting to and then uh, this terminal also has 5 volts and ground on it 
Now, uh, this is where one of the design decisions I've made comes in. Essentially, these are going to be some horizontal header pins so that we can connect to a, an external board. And this way, this whole board is separate from everything else so we can connect to whatever we like rather than having it hardwired into an LCD, for example. Now, the output register uh, is a little bit weird uh, in the sense that it, in some cases, doesn't really feel like it does anything. Uh, but it's important we have one uh, because it allows the CPU to access different, uh, multiple different things on the same bus. Again, it's much like the RAM and the ROM. So, this is essentially a buffer. What happens is um, the the CPU will make an I/O request and then tell uh, the uh, glue logic uh, down on the other side of the schematic that it wants to write uh, to the or in other words wants to output some data this uh, is essentially a buffer so uh, or a storage register so what this does is uh, when it's clocked it loads in all of the values that are on the are on its data bus and stores them inside and then uh, it will output those uh, onto the uh, uh, onto its output uh, lines. So even when the uh, data bus has gone into a different bit of data and the uh, CPU is accessing a different chip, it will still be outputting uh, that data so uh, that it essentially stores it for you uh, so you can output it at all times rather than having to constantly keep outputting it directly from the CPU which means you can't access anything else moving on to the uh, input registers uh, again this is the same as the decoders these look like two chips but it'll actually be one uh, in the uh, real thing again that saves us some space and we've got the same terminal with ground and 5 volts again um, however this uh, is actually uh, a register to store what's being input into the system so when um, the uh, essentially information will be stored uh, will be stored in these chips whenever uh, this pin is low oh, sorry whenever this pin is high and then uh, when this pin goes low it will be outputted straight into the data bus so uh, essentially again it's a method of storing the data uh, capturing the data and storing it until the CPU actually wants it so if the CPU is completing a task uh, but you say press a key on the keyboard then this will store the data until the CPU actually requests to receive it uh, and again this means that the CPU doesn't have to be constantly tracking uh, and reading this uh, bit of information it can just uh, do what it wants to do and then get the information so it's kind of just like a, a train station if you will it just holds things for a while until they can move on so again we have our IO glue logic uh, it's connected to IO request, uh, write and A0. Again, this m works in much the same way as the memory glue logic. Uh, just uh, depending on the uh, pins on the CPU, it will access either input or output. And finally, uh, we have an inverter here actually, uh, just because uh, some of this, uh, this needs one of these signals needs to be inverted uh, as uh, uh, these. chip uh, these chips uh, one of these chips is active high uh, and uh, this chip is active low finally uh, we have some LEDs on the data bus uh, just to show uh, what's currently going on, on the data bus it's kind of just a visual thing uh, just so we can see how uh, the CPU is actually working so I hope you've enjoyed this video uh, and I'll uh, see you in the next chapter where we can uh, look at things a little bit more uh, in detail. Uh, I'll be looking at the uh, 
I'll be running through the logic again in the next chapter just so you can hopefully understand it a little bit better. Sometimes it helps to hear things twice uh, and also it'll be nice to actually see the chips and see how they're all connected rather than this schematic which uh, can be a little bit confusing.